many years ago, the airlines started incorporating surveillance systems on their planes, in their terminals, taking pictures of passengers, those coming and going. Uh, I don't know how you felt about that, but um, when the first cameras, surveillance cameras came out a couple decades ago, I felt it was an invasion of privacy <clears throat> to be monitored. Uh, to have recordings of you that you didn't permit, you didn't authorize. And now, you know, today we've kind of acclimated to this situation where there's cameras uh, virtually everywhere, <laughs> including in some appliances, and then uh, intersections and highways and so on. But how did you feel when this first came about? Did you feel that your, uh, your freedoms were being threatened by being yeah, videotaped? You still do, yes, and some of us still do. But you know, recording of your comings and goings, the things you say, the things you do, um, the, the activities you're engaged in, whether good or bad, it's been going on for thousands of years. There's been the invisible, okay, recording system. Um, recording angels, taking note of the good deeds and the bad deeds, recording them in a book. And so, we shouldn't be too alarmed with what's happening in society because, after all, we all need to be held accountable to someone. Ultimately, we're all accountable to God. Well, I'm going to take you to Revelation 5, and we're going to look at this accountability system. It kind of climaxes at the end of time. And it's kind of an ongoing process, but there's a, there's a climax. Uh, and so we'll uh, see some of the scriptures on the screen and some will be, uh, you'll need to be in your Bible in Revelation chapter 5. You're going to learn a little bit more about the lion and the lamb. You've heard different depictive stories about the lion and the lamb that will lie down together in the new earth. That's a beautiful scene. Who else, uh, is there anyone I should say that's depicted as the lion and the lamb both? the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't want to show you a picture of the lamb slain here because, you know, some of us get a little squeamish when we see scars and tissue and blood. So we've got a nice clean picture here of the lion and the lamb this morning. Um, just a disclaimer, this message may be incomplete. But God's word is not incomplete. And so you can read the full story for yourself, what you don't hear this morning. We've been kind of working through um, the book of Revelation incrementally. Uh, we're told there's a blessing when we study the book of Revelation. And there's recorded uh, many mighty angels in the book. And I'm fascinated with strength and power. It's kind of a guy thing where we, we like, you know, not necessarily to personally demonstrate it, but we like to see success and victory, whatever it is. Uh, we're just kind of competitive, guys are. But um, so we're working through Revelation and looking at some of the strength of angels. We're told that the Lord is with us like a mighty warrior. And we don't have to fear. Remember, no fear. Uh, there's a slogan about that. Many, isn't there a clothing company that has... Something like no fear is their slogan. Anyway, um, no fear originates from the Bible, not some marketing company. So we looked at uh, last week, Revelation 10, and the mighty angel that was uh, described very, very well. And one artist depicted this angel like this, that it proclaims, this angel proclaims God's last message. I know we tend to focus on the three angels' message, We've done that, and it's beautiful, and we need to because it's very important. But the angel of Revelation 10 has a final warning message, and that you can see that on YouTube if you want to go back to last week's message. The angel was, is represented as having one foot on the sea and one foot on dry land which is uh, showing that the message will be carried to distant lands and encompass the entire world, earth. And now to uh, Revelation chapter 5. 
And in chapter 5, 1, we're going to get to that in a moment. Um, there's this uh, throne room scene in heaven that we're going to look at this morning where <clears throat> the Ancient of Days is present and there's a handing off, if you will, like a baton, a scroll. Now, if you've ever been in competitive track events where there's a baton involved with relay runners, you realize how important it is that you don't ever drop the baton. In fact, I realized that because I was one of those runners. <clears throat> and so this baton is, is uh, very unique, of course, the scroll. Now, when I was able to give away one of my daughters in marriage to a young man uh, many years ago, I won't go back that far, I might date myself, but I prepared for this event and I says, <clears throat> son-in-law, I'm just delighted to have you. But there's something I need to share with you about my daughter. I labored for 20 plus years to raise this beautiful lady. And in some ways there was success, in some ways there's more growth needed in this young lady. I'm passing the baton and I dropped it. No. <laughs> Don't drop the baton. I'm passing the baton on to you because you are now the head of household. I was the head of household for her for 20 some years. But now you are the spiritual leader. Here's the baton. He smiled and <laughs> he's a very fine man. Now, another 20 years later, <clears throat> he knows what I mean because he's raising kids of his own. <laughs> so um, anyway, carry the baton and don't let it go. Okay, let's go back to verse 1. It was, uh, you'll have to read it from your own Bible because I don't have it on the screen, sorry. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So the scroll is very unique in that it's, it's compacted, you know, like you have these digital you know, ways of recording information. You can get it on a little thumb drive. <clears throat> Well, this is the original version. You see, oftentimes the scrolls were just written on one side, but this one happens to be written on both sides because there's so much information and it's necessary to keep it into one scroll. Now to verse uh, 2. And I saw a mighty angel. Hmm. I think some versions say a strong angel. Anyway, proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seal? Now, what led me to this message initially was my search for angels in the Bible, particularly strong ones or mighty ones. And believe me, there's not that many classified as such. Now, I know they're all strong, they're all mighty, but some are especially mighty and strong. So it's with a loud voice. He's asking a simple question. It's in the form of a pro proclamation. Who is worthy to open this scroll and to break its seals? So the underlying point of the message is now, who's worthy? This is a great gathering with thousands, tens of thousands of angelic beings. And some of the redeemed who have gone before us, okay? And in this great multitude, who's worthy? Verse 3 says, And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. You mean to tell me unfallen angels are not worthy to open this scroll? What about those who have been... Humans who have been translated, those who have been resurrected from the dead. Surely somebody has to be, I mean, their sins are forgiven. They've, someone's got to be worthy of this, opening the scroll. Well, this chapter, the fifth chapter of Revelation, needs to be studied more closely than we do. 
You know, we tend to think the book of Revelation is a sealed book. Well, it's it's not. There are portions that are sealed. In other words, the, some of the messaging in it is not totally revealed, but will be at the end of time. But generally, the book of Revelation is is an open book. Why do we need to study it? It's because it is of great importance to those who are going to be acting out a part in the work for God in the last days. We're living in the last days, so this includes you and I. And if we're going to do a good work or a great work for God, we need to understand the books of Daniel and Revelation. So there is an open hand, and there lies a book. What's in the book? Now, there's different books in heaven. We won't take time this morning to explore the book of life and book of deeds and all these things. But this book is, as it is opened, the role is, it unveils the history of God's providences from the beginning of this world's history to the end. The prophetic history of nations and of churches. Shingle Springs will be in there. Okay? And here's contained in this book divine utterances. His authority, his commandment, his laws. The whole symbolic council of the eternal and the history of all the ruling powers that have ever risen and fallen on this globe. So there's going to be some symbolic language, but it's contained in the role, the influence that every nation has ever had, every tongue, every people, from the beginning of Earth's history to its closing scenes. The role that is written within and without, John says we should study. So who's worthy to break the seal? Not only to take the scroll in their hands, but to begin opening the seals one by one. You see, no man and no angel, no one in the entire universe is qualified to open this seal, this, this scroll, this book, except one. Verse 4. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Seven, the number seven represents perfection, as you know. And so by having seven seals on the scroll, it represents fulfillment, if you will. Completion, end of story. So what is this lion in the tribe of Judah? If you recall, uh, Jacob had 12 sons, and one son was Judah. He was represented as a lion. The figure of a lion signifies strength, and Christ has won the victory in the great controversy with evil. I used to... Uh, <clears throat> play some competitive sports in the local high school here, just, just for fun. And the, the, um, our mantra, our symbol for our teams were cougars. Well, the cougar is not as strong as a lion, but the cougar signified swiftness. And therefore, usually victory goes to the swiftest, right? Or at least the strongest. And so we felt like champions just by having those jerseys and going out on the playing field. But getting that behind us, if we have a lion with us, behind us, 
the strength and power of a lion, then what would we have to fear? Christ has won the victory over the great controversy with evil. And that's what qualifies him to open the scroll. See, Christ has prevailed. He is the triumphant one. The one who champions the cause for his people. He's victorious. And no one in the entire universe could open the book but him. He's also depicted as the lamb that was slain. The one who has been redeemed or has redeemed mankind. In the great controversy, there is the issue of the integrity of the character of God, which is fully expressed in his law. But neither angel nor man could have accomplished this vindication for God. Only God could do it in the form of Jesus Christ. You see, angels are subject to God's law. Humans are subject to his God's law. God's law represents God himself. Therefore, he is the one who is qualified to vindicate the character of God. Only Christ, who is God, and of whose character the law is an expression, could achieve such a vindication of the divine character. And this is actually central to the chapter of chapter 5 of Revelation. Now, what is the focal point of the vision? It now turns to the victorious one, Jesus Christ. Verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. The rest of the verses will be in your Bible. Verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Our prayers given today are there. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands. You get the picture how large a group surpasses any gathering on earth. Saying in a loud voice, worthy is the lamb which was slain to receive power and wealth, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing, honor, and glory, and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped him. To understand biblical events is true higher education. I want to share a few thoughts from the pen of inspiration. Because there's a lot of pursuit in our modern society to obtain a higher education.
excuse me while I scroll to my notes here. Somehow they did not end up on the right device this morning. There's a constant progress in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ whom he has sent. But when men feel that they are wise above a thus saith the Lord, they need to become fools in order that they may become wise. Isn't there a scripture to that? The living oracles of God were given to lie at the very foundation of all true education. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There is a distinction to be made between the sacred and the common. And we are accountable to God if we place human wisdom at the head as essential for education. Language may change and study books may present the supposed improvements. But in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. John, the beloved disciple, said that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. This is true wisdom. This is higher education to know God. Will you choose to make that your pursuit today?